about chapter 25, section 1. It's called The Beginnings of Industrialization. And we'll be talking about the Industrial Revolution and how it started in England and soon spread to other countries. Um, so... A series of events occurred over 200 years ago that brought about huge changes in the way that people lived. That was the time when fast, power-driven machines started to do work that up until that time had only been done by human hands. It was when the first big factories were built to house workers and the machines they operated. It was when the production of manufactured goods increased dramatically. When the lives of human beings first started to be regulated by clocks and factory bells. It was also when rural populations declined as people headed to factories to find steady work, when cities rapidly grew, and when pollution of the environment began to occur on a massive scale. Taken together, these events started the world's first industrial revolution. First off, I want to look at this in regards to the changes that it made in the everyday lives of ordinary people. Because the Industrial Revolution was a time uh, when machine-made goods began to outproduce human-made goods. And that's why it's called a revolution. It's a major change in the way that things are made, which trickled down to a major change in the way that people lived. Um, this actually began in England in the 1700s. Um, and, and, and we're going to see changes in, again, the way that manufacturing occurs, but we'll start with the agricultural revolution. Um, for one, farmers began to fence in their farms. And these are called enclosures for a number of reasons. One, allowing your cattle to openly graze will destroy all farms in the area. Everywhere a herd of cows goes, boom, they trample up the soil, they eat all the crops, and it ruins farms and fields. And so wealthy landowners would buy and then pay for these fences to go around their properties. Um, and these enclosures allow experimentation with different methods of agriculture. Before the Industrial Revolution began in England around the year 1760, the way most people lived in Europe and America was very different from how they live today. Nine out of ten people lived in rural areas. There was a large, mostly poor lower class, a small, rich upper class, and not much of a middle class. Rural people raised most of their food on small farms and they didn't have to leave home each day to work at their jobs. Back then, there were no electric lights, no movies, no telephones, no recorded music, and no cars. Ordinary people used their hands to make most of the things they needed. They had no reason to own a clock, since their lives were tuned to the rising and setting of the sun. The world was pretty quiet before the Industrial Revolution, because there were no machines for rapid transportation to fill the air with noise. Without these devices, people didn't travel much. Consequently, except for their own villages, they knew very little about the world in which they lived. The pace of life was much slower before the Industrial Revolution, because people had to walk or use horses to move from place to place. There was no public education, so few people could read and write. And due to poor nutrition and living conditions, they didn't live nearly as long as people do today. Here's what I'm talking about. You know, this is a mid-1700s enclosure farm. These walls are made from piled stones. That means humans, one at a time, one by one, piled up, all of these stones. You can imagine that is a lot of work. But the benefit, again, is keeping the farms contained to certain property lines, keeping livestock out of those farms. And so one of the experiments tried with the enclosure movement was crop rotation. 
So now that you have a contained, a finite field that you can look at and see, you can do some experiments. What happens if I grow the same crop in that same field year after year after year? And then I measure how much food am I making each year? Which if you're a good business person, that's what you should do. So year after year after year, growing the same crop in the same field year after year, it is a proven fact that you will produce less food over time until the farm becomes unusable. You go out of business, starve to death, and die. But what if, what if you try a different crop the next season? It's worth a shot, right? Because the alternative is starve to death and die. So what if I try a different crop next season? Or, here's a crazy thought, I have three fields, and I'm going to leave one empty each year. And after all the different experiments, crop rotation, also known as the three field system, became the standard. <clears throat> Livestock breeders also began to experiment in genetics. Hey, that cow looks awesome. Hey, that cow looks awesome. Let's get them together on a date. Two cows go on a date. Baby cow's awesome. Gee, that's not rocket science. It works. So let's breed cows to make better cows through controlled breeding techniques. It will strengthen the breed. More importantly, it will produce more food. That cow's super fat. That cow's super fat. What happens if we make super fat baby cow? More food. That cow produces a lot of milk. That cow is a boy. Well, he looks strong. She makes a lot of milk. Get him on a date. And all of these types of experiments lead to an increase in the population because it actually has a measurable effect on the amount of food in these places. Textile manufacturing was the first major industry to undergo industrialization. And for many people, the change was tragic. That was because before the Industrial Revolution, the poor rural population had few ways of earning a living, except for the unreliable income they got from farming. But in Europe especially, many rural people could add to their incomes by working at what were known as domestic or cottage industries by making cloth. The way this worked was that cloth merchants purchased large quantities of wool from sheep farmers, as well as linen fibers from flax farmers. The merchants then delivered the material to cottage workers to be made into cloth. First the fibers were spun into yarn using a simple foot-powered machine called a spinning wheel. Then, under what was known as the putting out system, the yarn was then distributed to weavers to be woven into certain types of cloth on a hand loom. It took a long time, but after the roll of cloth was finished, the merchants paid the cottage workers for what they had done. These traditional home-based textile workers were the first people to be replaced by machines when the Industrial Revolution began. So what we're talking about is moving from the small scale to the large scale. Industrialization even is moving from human production of goods to machine production of goods. Machines can make things far more efficiently than we can. And Britain had a number of advantages, the reasons why Great Britain went to this before others. First off, an abundance of natural resources, the raw materials, coal, iron, <coughs> rivers for transportation, harbors for commerce, also capital. In fact, you'll find there are three basic factors needed to make anything. Three basic factors. So like Epic who makes Fortnite, they have these three basic factors. Land, somewhere is an office full of people making Fortnite updates. They gotta have land. They gotta have labor. Somebody has to do all that crazy coding to make it happen. I mean, that weird dance that Fortnite people do doesn't just do itself. Somebody had to code that dance. Okay, land, labor, and then what's the next variable? Does anybody know? 
What is it? Well, that's the land. Yeah, Nora? Money. Money. We'll use the term capital. Land, labor, capital. The three main factors of production. <coughs> land, labor, capital. In the 1760s, two new machines, the spinning jenny and the water frame, caused a revolution in the textile industry because both machines markedly sped up the process of making thread for weaving. These machines were adapted to use the power of flowing water or hydraulic power. This means that the motion of the water would turn a wheel that was connected by a complicated system of pulleys and belts used to run the machines. Another machine called the spinning mule was developed later in the 1700s. When it was hooked up to water power, just one person could do the work of 3,000 hand spinners. The new textile machines were extremely efficient at producing the fine thread needed to make high quality cloth and they caused the cottage spinning industry to collapse soon after they were introduced. A little later, mechanized power looms were developed that used water power instead of human muscle power to weave thread into cloth. One important invention adapted to power weaving from hand looms was a mechanized version of the flying shuttle seen here. This was a special device used to rapidly weave a cross thread through the webs of thread on the loom. On power looms, this process took place at an incredible speed when compared to doing it by hand. It is not surprising that the much more efficient power looms rapidly ended the cottage weaving industry. In England in 1811, unemployed home textile workers called the Luddites, got so angry about losing their jobs that they rioted and tried to destroy the new textile machines. Okay, so <clears throat> there's a fourth factor. It's kind of the X factor. Ooh, see what I did, Deadpool fans? Okay, there's a fourth factor. Um, it's called entrepreneurs. That is, that's great. There's an abundance of land. There's all kinds of workers. Yay, there's all the money in the world. <coughs> Somebody has to be willing to risk their money on the off chance that they might fail. You know, what if I set up a factory to make textiles and nobody buys my clothing line? I've just lost all my money. I starve to death and die. Boom. Well, that sucks for me. Um, so you have to have a situation where there are people with capital that are willing to invest it. <clears throat> and one of the ingredients to create that situation is political stability. <clears throat> you see, if we're at war, I don't have time, I don't have the resources, I certainly don't have the desire to start a new business. Because for all I know, the Vikings are going to come in and cut all my people's heads off with the axes. I don't want to start a new business if we're at war. I don't want to start a new business if presidents are killing one another. <coughs> so instead, I'm going to wait for a safe and stable time or safe and stable place. <coughs> and when we talk about the growth of the factory system, most historians start with the textile industry because this was one of the first industries to mechanize. You see, you got little old lady sewing. Little old lady can sew and can make clothing for her family. But a machine like a weaver or a flying shuttle can make far more clothing, far more efficiently. Also, <clears throat> a water frame. Long before electricity, or even long before steam, factories were using the power of water wheels to run all of the machines in their factory. And so the power loom working off of the water frame can speed up production dramatically. And so cloth can be made 
in mass by machines in factories. Factories are simply buildings that contain the machines for manufacturing. Another case in point, this relates to agriculture, but the cotton gin developed by Eli Whitney, an American by the way, allowed one person to increase their work by eight times. One person increased their work by eight times. Extremely significant. I don't need eight farmers anymore. I only need one. Or if I'm a farm of a hundred, I don't need a hundred farmers anymore. I only need a portion of that. In the late 1700s and early 1800s, large buildings called factories began to appear along rivers in Europe and North America. Factories are places where workers operating expensive, usually very complicated machines, produce manufactured goods. The creation of factories was a turning point in human society because people had to leave home each day to earn a living. This radically changed family life and the way children were raised. New housing for workers had to be built near the factories and as this happened, Cities rapidly grew in size while rural populations decreased. And because people had to meet production deadlines, they were expected to show up at the factories at specific times. This meant that for the first time in history, large numbers of human lives began to be regulated by clocks and the ringing of factory bells. For example, the schedule seen here shows that in 1874, the long workday at the Lowell Mills began at 6.45 in the morning and ended at 6 in the evening, except on Saturday, when it ended at 4.30. On Sunday, however, workers were given a day off. So, these types of technologies, you know, we're looking here at a spinning Jenny. That's the bottom right. <coughs> uh, the photograph in the center is a flying shuttle. Um, these types of technologies um, had an impact on the rest of the world. You see, it didn't just benefit England. You know, for example, an American entrepreneur named Samuel Slater uh, went to these factories in England, went on a tour of these factories, and came back and copied the model and developed his own in Lowell, Massachusetts. Next is the steam engine. You see, the steam engine, developed by James Watt, was actually paid and financed by another, a wealthy entrepreneur. Had it not been for Matthew Bolton, there might not have been a steam engine. But Matthew Bolton had, had nothing to do with the technology. He just paid for it. He just said, hey, I'd like a thing that can let my boat go up a river. What do you say? You're smart. Figure it out. James Watt said, okay, well, I need money <coughs> to try a bunch of different ideas. Bolton said, I got plenty of money. You just figure out the idea. Okay, fair enough. And he developed the steam engine. Next, you get Robert Fulton. Robert Fulton was not an inventor. I don't know if he was intelligent or not, but he was a risk taker. There was a standing bet among boat operators to see who could get a boat up a river the fastest. You know, like Brooklyn was pointing out, boats can go up rivers without a steam engine, but it's much slower. So the question was, who can break this record to make a boat go up the river the fastest? Robert Fulton was like, I'm a millionaire. I want to win this bet. I'm going to make it happen. Hey, you look smart. Figure this out. Here's lots of money. So a smart guy figures it out, puts the steam engine on the boat. They call it a steamboat. He takes his boat, now super speed steamboat, right? And he flies that thing up the river. Not super fast, but fast relative to the time. He gets up the Hudson River in 32 hours. No one had done anything remotely close. He won the bet. He's now famous. He's in the history books. 
for being super rich and paying someone else to figure it out for him. But anyway, um, he did it. And as a result, we can now take boats up rivers. Also, roads. The Industrial Revolution came to America mainly through two instances of what today would be called industrial espionage or industrial spying. The spying occurred because the designs of English textile machines were carefully guarded secrets. They had brought England so much wealth that laws prohibited shipping the machines out of the country for fear that people might copy them. The first case of industrial spying took place sometime in the 1780s when a man who had been employed at an English spinning factory named Samuel Slater memorized every detail of how the machines were built. He moved to the United States the year George Washington was elected president and had copies made of the English machines. Then he opened up a cotton spinning mill in Pawtucket, Rhode Island and put them to work. And by the beginning of the 19th century, 100 workers, mostly women and children aged 7 to 14, could be found laboring here at Slater's Mill. The second case of espionage that brought the Industrial Revolution to America produced copies of English power looms which were first employed in the United States in the year 1814. Like the design of the spinning machine, the design of the power loom had been secretly memorized from English machines. And once America had power looms, it rapidly became an important textile manufacturing nation. But more importantly, railroads. You see, in 1804, the first steam-driven locomotive was developed. And within a few years, you're laying out tracks for rail lines all over Great Britain. In fact, by the 1860s in the United States, there would be rail tracks all over. And by 1869, there would be a rail track going all the way across the country. And so instead of, you know, Donner family, walk, 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 walk. Oh, dang, we're stuck in the Rockies and let's start eating each other. Yeah, that was a thing that happened. Now what do I do? I want to go to California. I pay a ticket. I give some smart guy money. He gets me there. He or she gets me there. And you see, railroads, again, game changer. Working off of existing technology. And these people made lots of money as a result. There's the steam driven locomotive, by the way. That's the very first one. It's a very, it's a somewhat simple concept. You know, you've got a fire right in the back of it. They literally built a fire using coal. <clears throat> Somewhere in there is a container for water. Heat the container, water turns to steam, and you know, there's the pressure release valve is, is your little chimney. But you can contain the pressure, you can harness the pressure, and if you look at this, here's where the steam escapes, goes into the piston, and boom, that's combustion. That's propulsion. That's big. Even though the first mechanical spinning and weaving machines in America were copied from English machines, one truly American invention, called the cotton gin, helped revolutionize the textile industry. Cotton plants produce excellent fibers, and in America's southern states, cotton was very cheap to produce because unpaid slaves were used to grow and harvest the crop. Yet even though the demand for cotton was great, before the invention of the cotton gin, it was not widely used in textiles. That was because cotton fibers are contained in the plant's seed pods, and before the fiber can be spun into threads, the seeds must be removed. Cleaning cotton was a very slow process when done by hand. But after 1793, the year Eli Whitney invented his cotton gin, simply by turning a crank, it was possible to remove as many seeds from raw cotton in a single day as 50 people could do using just their hands. Because the cotton gin made the fibers more readily available, there was a great increase in cotton production. Consequently, there was an increase in the number of slaves working on plantations as well. 
After the invention of the cotton gin, the raising of cotton rapidly became the backbone of the economy in the southern United States. And so putting the steam engine on a train caused a major industrial growth. It created whole new jobs and fields that people had never even knew existed before. It led to cheaper transportation. <clears throat> It boosted many industries. Many people started moving to cities because there's good paying jobs in these fields. So technology spurs economic growth. 